the future of food on sustainability and food science and we have a really oops I need to move this closer to me because I want to look at this fine gentleman here so um, we have a very exciting group um, today okay I'm removing this because this is not easy with the way I talk and move it around okay very exciting group today so we have chef Kerry Havernan who was in, on the previous panel who is um, a chef but also works a lot with uh, sustainability and uh, with fish um, and uh, seafood and then we have Paul Bryan um, who is a former creator and showrunner of Catching Hell TV and now a foodpreneur, right? Um, Co-owner of Fish, Wild Fish Direct, a sustainable seafood company. We have Brian Halwell, uh, publisher and editor of Edible Communities, who has been at the forefront of the growing Eat Local movement. And we have Adrian Grant Alfieri, I was a venture partner at Babel Ventures and the leading early stage biotech VCs in Silicon Valley. And I'm Alina Furman, and uh, someone who has been on the forefront of the food revolution. Um, I'm a former CNN journalist turned foodpreneur myself. Um, I invented um, food uh, therapeutic soups that serve as supplements. I've been fascinated where the food is going and the future of um, of food, and that's what I want to talk about. Because um, I've been watching how, in the past ten years, which is how long I've been involved in, the, in this um, in, in this space and on my own little journey, um, how the tastes of consumers have been changing. How we've been increasingly interested in organic, local, sustainable, green, clean. You know, all of those hashtags that we like to populate our social media with. And uh, but at the same time. Um, we're looking at feeding the planet that's growing really fast and uh, predicted to be 10 billion people by 2050, which is 30 years from now, right? So I would like to ask every one of uh, each one of you, um, where do you see the future of food in the next 30 years? So let's start with you, Carrie, and just move down. Uh, well, that's a huge question, and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I don't know that I have all the resources, but I have an, an inkling, perhaps. Um, and, and obviously, it would be... Um, really continuation of many of the things that I hope that we've started to, to plant the seeds in, in terms of, um, you know, in my little neck of the woods, the sustainability of, of seafood that we're continuing to, you know, foster an environment in which, you know, wild fish can grow and that, um, and that we can harvest them in a way that's responsible. But also, obviously, in the, in the, in the realm of um, aquaculture. And aquaculture um, is really growing by leaps and bounds. And it would sort of be the most obvious um, potential, I guess, in terms of, of, a, of a business model to grow more food for the planet um, and to do so in a sustainable way. Um, I think I mentioned at the earlier panel, there's something called Re uh, Recycled Agriculture Systems, RAS, um, that basically could happen anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country, um, because they are, as the name implies, recycled water. So they don't need to be as um, many farms, you know, shrimp and salmon, for example, traditionally are in estuary areas that, that would uh, need a, a fresh supply of seawater and then hopefully clean it and put it back. Um, this is recycling that can happen anywhere in the, in the, in the country or the world. Um, so I'd say that that side of aquaculture, and um, I really believe that, that, that seaweed is a, a great future source. Now, it's, it's not immediately the, the greatest protein source, um, but it is certainly uh, an, an adjunct and a supplement to many of the things that we're eating. And I think it gives uh, nutritionally um, uh, a diversity that, you know, you really can't get from land-based plants. Uh, similar to what Kerry said, I think that, um, that the, the biggest leaps and bounds uh, in the seafood sector right now are being made in aquaculture. Um, Land-based aquaculture being the number one area of interest uh, on the sustainability level because then you're dealing with less affluent, less uh, pollutants in the environment. You're uh, also dealing with the, you're eliminating the risk of escapement. Um, so those, wi those uh, farm fish are not going to be contaminating our, our wild fisheries. Um, and, um, and then you're simultaneously just overall putting a lot less into the environment, um, whether it's from a food perspective, uh, fish feed, um, or whether it's from antibiotics, which I think, uh, you know, that's 
biggest area of concern in aquaculture is antibiotics. Uh, Land-based protein has, um, I, I think, done a lot better since the aquaculture industry is newer, um, especially the growth sector of the aquaculture industry. I think that there's still a lot of improvement um, overall as an industry that's going to be happening. Um, you know, and, and to that level, I mean, we're, when, when we say antibiotics and seafood, we're talking about uh, what the WHO is predicting will be the cause of um, more deaths than cancer by 2050. So we're talking about a huge, you know, inf uh, impact on, um, on the health of society. And so I think we'll see uh, a lot more sustainability, a lot more um, land-based aquaculture systems. Uh, and I think, you know, that's also going to kind of cut down on w another problem that we have right now, which is plastics in the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, microplastics in the ocean, which is just, is just such a massive global problem. Um, and, and, and I think it's showing up to an extent where um, there's going to be people that start to see aquaculture as preferable to wild capture, um, in, especially in certain parts of the world. So um, uh, I definitely think that aquaculture, it's, it's uh, the other thing that's exciting about it is uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, in line with the theme of this conference, food and, and, and tech um, connecting, because that's really where we're seeing just a tremendous amount of development. There's, there's aquaculture facilities coming up. There's um, one called uh, uh, Dutch Kingfish. They are powered entirely by solar and wind power. It's a new facility. Um, so you're, you're getting investment bankers that are coming in now and just seeing the potential uh, to grab onto technology and really apply that to our food source in innovative ways that, you know, sure, they're spending a ton of money to get these things off the ground, but what, where is that going to lead to? I mean, I think that's a footprint for where we're going to be in 30 years for sure. You're going to see, I would say, uh, a tremendous increase in the overall sustainability of aquaculture. Um, and then, you know, on, a, on, on another level, I also agree with Carrie that, um, that uh, ocean-based plants are, are, you know, whether those are grown in the ocean or whether those are grown uh, on a farm, you know, multi-trophic um, aquaculture, uh, land farms, that's, you know, another area of interest, trying to figure out what we can do with our waste. Um, you know, so I think it's just basically cleaner all the way around from, you know, from feed, from water, from you know, moving things on land, and then figuring out how to recycle and upcycle, and you know, uh, sort of be able to utilize uh, on multiple different levels what the resources that we do have. So I, I think you know, certainly not um, taking away from wild capture fisheries because those are still incredibly important. I mean, the whole point is to. Uh, partially with aquaculture is to feed more people, right? Already right now it's feeding 50% of the world. Um, the growth and 50% of the growth in the, in the seafood industry has is, is been aquaculture. Um, but I think at the same time then that also allows our wild fisheries to thrive and to become more sustainable and to, you know, be able to be a resource that's around for a long time. So, um, you know, Primarily, those are kind of the areas that I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, I, I, and I just think that it's a lot of niches within that, whether it's feed or treatments or uh, facilities. I think that's where we're going to, you know, see a lot of uh, improvement in the next 30 years. Um, well, you know, I, I, I think adding on to what's been said is that things are moving so quickly in food now that it's very, uh, it's hard to, for me to think out 30 years. I mean, think of all the little things that have happened. Like, you know, we didn't used to, we used to make all restaurant reservations by calling, right? That, that's over. And that's Open Table was founded, I think, 10 years ago, if that. And so you think of, yeah. I mean, my town has banned plastic bags at grocery stores. There's just all these little innovations that are starting to add up. And to your point, it's because all the, the problems with our existing food chain are beginning to crack and show. And so investors, farmers, everyone is basically saying, there's a big opportunity here to come up with what we're going to eat tomorrow. Um, the big question I keep asking is, is it helping us eat better? Is it helping us farm better? I think I can point to tons of technology that is, but also tons of technology that's probably just gadgetry and a waste of resources. So I think that we're going to see some very unpredictable trends, but a lot of good stuff. Um, 
our palates in America are definitely expanding dramatically. You think of kimchi and Negronis yeah. and bitter foods, sure. which didn't even exist on, you know, in the American playbook. Uh, and also on the farm, I mean, really everywhere in the chain, food chain, you see that there's just complete you know, disruption happening. So another trend I'm seeing is from big farm machines to really little farm machines, like small farm robots and automation and drones are kind of an extension of that. So that basically puts all the agricultural infrastructure that preceded it out of business. So I think we're just going to start seeing some really rapid shifting. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, from a VC perspective, a lot of what we look at is markets. I'm sure Brian can chat about this as well. Um, but when you're looking at market trends specifically related to food and bev around the world, you're looking at two specific ones. And that's what our firm and a lot of people in Silicon Valley are looking at. And the first one is developing countries, right? So when you gain wealth within a family or community, you buy more meat and you have pets, right? So we're looking at meat there. And then again, as much as we want to talk about health and wellness in the beautiful city of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. or where I'm from, Miami, or New York, or San Francisco, where I work, that is very different than middle America. And that's honestly where the largest market opportunity is. And so if you're looking at it from a purely economics point of view, which we have to from a VC perspective, because that's our job, we're looking at those two markets. And as a result, our focus internally is around large-scale animal agriculture, right? So we're specifically looking at meat replacements. And internally, and what a lot of Silicon Valley is looking at right now is three primary pathways or three ways that can manifest. And the first, you guys have probably heard about because every news outlet is covering it, uh, is clean meat, which is uh, also called franken meat or lab-grown meat or synthetic meat. Um, and we can dive into that. Or cultured meat. Uh, right? and that's what and Richard Branson is, you know, that prophesizing what that, that that's Bill what we're going to have. <laughs> are invested in. Interestingly, Tyson and Cargill, the biggest U.S. meat producers. Um, that's kind of the definition of market signals. Um, and then the two other pathways are fungi-based protein and plant-based protein, right? So when we're looking at meat, we either look at meat replacements or alternatives, which are in the form of high-protein alternatives. And so from a VC perspective, when we're mapping markets, we're looking at those three pathways. And so a lot of people think what VC does is study founders, products, uh, companies. But a lot of it, to be honest, is market mapping and understanding the emerging pathways. And so when we come down to that fundamental question of what are we going to be eating in 10, 20, 30, 50 years and right. why, we can't just think about companies and entrepreneurs. We think about markets. So I think we can discuss that. Yeah, and that's that's exactly leads to the next question, which you know obviously we're seeing a lot of frenzy, you know, in the uh, in the food science and the innovation, and then the UN report is predicting soaring demand for protein. Like they're saying that 76 percent demand for meat in the in the mostly from the developing world, and so when. I am trying to reconcile in my mind is, okay, so we are growing meat in a lab, right? And um, we're going plant-based, um, so the protein is going to come from fake protein, plant-based protein, um, a lot of it, um, then fake meat, or franken meat, or lab meat, or whatever we call it, <laughs> then crickets, right? Um, and seafood, they're doing seafood and that way. seafood, yeah. right. And so now, how does that translate into health? Because didn't we start GMO kind of the same way we're gonna try, we were trying to feed the planet, and then it turned into a disaster? And so are we just rewriting the script and creating another potential disaster with lab-grown meat, with all of the other methods that we were discussing. And who wants to take that on? <laughs> I can dive into that first, um, because we're invested in, in a lot of these lab-grown meat companies. Okay. Um, I mean, I will say, when you bring up GMO controversies, um, there's a lot of difference between actual disaster and media-inflated disaster. And I think it's way more overstated than a lot of us would like to admit. Um, putting that aside, within the lab-grown meat sector, what's actually interesting and really exciting about it is that once the initial product has been finalized, and a lot of these companies are two, three years away in terms of R&D, the, the nutrient profiles of this meat, um, and it is real meat, it's just a different production system, right? It's just machinery. It's just systems. And because it is real meat, you can actually enhance the nutrient profiles. You can enhance amino acid and omega-3 profiles. Um, Steve Jurvetson, um, one of the legendary Silicon Valley investors, um, loves, loves this specific aspect because of the consumer adoption side, right? At the end of the day, it's just a consumer product. And if it's not catering to evolving trends and tastes, then it's not going to do well. And some of these evolving mm -hmm. trends and tastes are daily intake of omega-3s, which I'm sure you guys can talk to as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. And I think also the perspective is, as you said, Memphis meat and folks who are culturing meat, which is basically growing it in a fermenting vat or a dish. Bioreactor. Exactly, in a bioreactor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, first of all, it's interesting there's a parallel to all the growth in indoor farming because the advocates and the owners of those farms also argue that they can, you know, f selectively fertilize and enhance the nutrients in those plants. Um, and I've seen many chefs do taste tests and say it tastes the same. I mean, I, I'm not going to say I've ever done anything like that. But the cultured meat is still, as you said, a few years out. I've heard 10 years out, but you're saying two to three years out. Depending on cost parity, yes. And, but what already exists is the plant-based alternatives, the impossible burger, uh, beyond mm -hmm. meat. And that's a pretty fast path to mm -hmm. like reducing meat in the diet or reducing seafood in the diet in, in that case. But I don't know. Yeah, there, there's a bit of a slippery slope, I think, to moving all agricultural production into a factory or a building. Yeah. But I, don't, I do know that ecologically cultured meat has been shown, lots of studies, it's vastly superior. You know, you're building a building, yes, but you know, greenhouse gas emissions are tiny compared to actual cows, pigs, et cetera. So that's, you know, it is actually checking that box of mm -hmm. improving the sustainability on one level. Yeah, but when we were talking in the previous panel about um, dis disenfranchised population and people who cannot afford proper nutrition, right? So we're dealing, if we're dealing with something that is lab produced, what are the costs going to be? What is it gonna cost to get the ingredients, to produce the ingredients, to sell the ingredients? You know, the every step of the way, and are we going to provide the health benefit, not just to everybody, but especially to people who cannot afford it, or is it gonna be like, Impossible Burger is pretty pricey. Mm. Um, so how are we gonna attack that? I mean, the quick parallel I'll say from indoor agriculture is that it's already competitive. And so the big farms, what do you have down here? You have like, um, uh, something Greens in Gotham East Greens. LA. Well, Gotham Greens is in New York okay. and Arrow Farms and these big operations okay. now that are doing literally acres in downtown areas. They say that they have price parity in the supermarket hmm. with field grown and that's just happened. So they would say they're eliminating food deserts and, and they're also shortening. The amazing thing which also goes for cultured meat is you don't have the shipping mm -hmm. because you can build those farms anywhere, including next to New York City, Los Angeles, or in a small town for that mm -hmm. matter. So, so it the, does, the, it really disrupts the whole meat chain or the whole food chain. So the future food is in the Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> it's not in the Silicon Valley. It is in Silicon Valley. Is in the Silicon Valley? Uh, no, I mean, they're doing a lot, but uh, they're not the only center of yeah. ag tech, food tech, grocery tech. Uh, but they're doing a lot. Think of what Amazon's doing with a, you know, right. employee-less supermarket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, also St. Louis is a huge center of ag tech innovation right now. Um, New York. I, I mean, New York as well, yeah. Um, uh, uh, SF and LA are specifically uh, biotech-enabled food and bev are leading mm -hmm. that direction. Um, I will say quickly, Impossible Foods is in Lake Castle and is almost at cost parity. And with their most recent round of funding, almost $300 million, they moved into East Asia um, and are almost at cost parity there as well. And they're doing a fantastic job. Um, but a question we come back to a lot is, Look, their hemoglobin, soy hemoglobin, their, their primary innovation was from a soy root, so they're plant-based, right? Um, meaning they can get to market very quickly. But we also have the question of, if we're looking at long-term markets, getting there quickly is not necessarily the better tech, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you're looking at mass effect on the food system, which we're all on the same page about, you're looking at mass adoption rates, right? And that's kind of the only variable that matters. And once lab-grown meat reaches cost parity, which it will in five, ten years, it may take ten years, but once it does, what do mass adoption rates look like right. then? If it hits a quicker slope than the Impossible Foods products may, then we should be shifting investment toward one area or another, right? And so right now with lab-grown meat, the two primary cost variables are on the inputs and then outputs. Specifically, uh, inputs, they're, they're right now using pharma-grade fetal bovine serum, which is essentially blood. It's a mix of amino acids and sucralose. Um, but it, because it's farmer grade and used in intensive R&D, no one has the supply chain for that. So a supply chain needs to be created. At the same time, you have bioreactors. And bioreactors at lab scale, 50, 100 liters, um, are already expensive. But when you're producing at 2,000 liters, even if biology is reacting the same way, it's just hugely expensive. And so a lot of what we're involved in, specifically with an early stage venture capital, is bridging that gap or delta between tech and tech at scale, right? 
And so within these companies, it's just biotech and biotech at scale. And the reason it's really exciting is because it's not any scientific breakthrough. Stem cell te technology is already there, right? Finless Foods, which we invested in, is synthetic seafood. That tech is already there. It's just the scaling on either end. And typically, if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, it was founded on the fact that tech can inherently scale once the tech is down. It's just an engineering and manufacturing problem. And so if you're looking at step changes, right, you're talking about leaps and bounds in technology, every 10, 15 years, costs within every industry come down exponentially. If you want to look at chip manufacturers and your iPhone, or more recently, if you want to look at 23andMe and how cheap it is to do um, DNA testing right now. I mean, every 5, 10, 15 years, this happens. And because it's just a manufacturing problem, that's why we're interested in how VC can interact with those spaces. So the other thing that I'd love to touch on um, is food as medicine, because that's definitely another future that we're going into. And aside from you know protein, looking at whole foods and filling the gap and really enhancing the uh, profiles of vegetables and creating the soil that's favorable to the organically grown and wonderfully nutritious <laughs> vegetables and herbs and everything else. So, um, I, and also sea vegetables as well. You know, how do we harvest them properly and make them available and cost effective um, for um, the growing population? And, uh, and really understand, we talked about education on the previous panel, have people understand how to eat for their health properly and really using food as medicine as we move into the future. And who wants to start on that? <laughs> um, I guess I can look at that in a very uh, sort of personal way. And I would say, um, and again, this is entirely my experience, um, that I fish a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to like to catch a wide variety of fish. And as many of those fish became harder to catch or there were less of them, I realized that I'd have to look at different parts of what was available to me. And I would go out there originally as a chef with almost a shopping list. I want to catch a tuna, I want to catch a striped bass, I want to catch whatever. And when those options weren't available to me, um, through primary through um, the availability of the, of the biomass that wasn't there, I had to start looking differently. I said, wait a minute, you know, maybe I can just get a few clams and I can get some sea vegetables that I wouldn't have looked at if I was able to catch a tuna. But there they were growing on the side of my property, basically, on the end of the road, in a little cove in, in New York, in Sag Harbor in Long Island, actually. Um, and I realized that um, I still need to make dinner, even though my, my shopping list was unsuccessful. Okay. So here I am coming up with, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, I was sort of forced to eat more of what the sea would give me rather than what I wanted from it. And therefore, it intrinsically became a little bit more healthy. I wasn't looking at what, unfortunately, I think a large part of the country, when they go to a fish restaurant, for example, they were classically trained to look at, let's say, a red lobster where whatever you get is going to be hanging off the edge of the plate, skinless, boneless protein without any you know, head or anything like that part of the animal, any shell. And I'm... I'm realizing that this is this is not new but what we should be looking at is maybe it's more a bowl of um, broth that's been you know uh, enriched with seaweed and it has a few clams in it so we're looking at a much mm -hmm. lower amount of protein but we're also looking at you know what it, what is available to you what 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 can you find and from that very personal standpoint i'm hoping that this this would provide a, a nutritious and uh environmentally friendly way to harvest things in the ocean mm -hmm. yeah, i like that I mean, I would just add that on an aquaculture perspective, it's really what we're putting into the fish that's contributing to the nutrition, right? So what I do all day long is I try to convince people that are selling popular species like salmon or tuna um, to, you know, big brands, healthy, fast, casual brands, um, you know, that might have the goal of having 500 locations nationwide. So, um, and they might be well on that path. Uh, and right now they might be serving salmon that's commodity farmed salmon. So it's got, you know, it's got antibiotics in it. Um, it has GMO feed. You know, it ha you're, you're looking at, um, you're just looking at the inputs to the protein and you're saying how can we improve on those and what can we take away that's a negative 
So really at the end of the day, what the fish is exposed to, we're exposed to. Um, and that has a tremendous impact on our health and our nutrition. You know, see, fish is, um, you know, one of the, if not the most important source of um, um, uh, uh, fatty acids. And so, and you know, so just looking at what we're putting in on the aquaculture side is the easiest thing to, for me to talk about because, I mean, that's something that we can, you know, you can flip a switch and not do it. You can, you know, you can use investment capital to then create new systems where you're eliminating the problems before they begin. Well, and, you know, I think the trend that the word is functional foods and functional mm -hmm. medicine, and that's kind of, I think, the big catch-all word right now, and you see functional beverages that have CBD or herbs or, uh, you know, other sorts of additives, and it really is not that different than, I mean, farmers fertilize to get particular, you know, to, to make sure that their string beans have a particular flavor profile or stiff, you know, so that they snap. Um, and we can probably, do, I think we can do that on a maybe a more efficient level now with micro dosing. And I mean, some of the small robot stuff that I've seen, you know, a tractor right now on a big farm in America, it's a giant thing. I mean, literally, you probably couldn't fit more than one of them in this room. And it can't do that much because it's such a giant, it's like the Hulk, you know, mm -hmm. it, it just, um, so imagine instead 40, a flock of 40 lawnmower size autonomous things that go between the corn and can do that any time of the year, can yeah. weed, can do tiny little squirts of fertilizer. I mean, so there's that, but that gets off your question about wellness. I'm just saying that there's, I think we're, you know, any sort of big inefficiency, people are, companies are trying to squash that out because mm -hmm. they just realize they're not going to have much of a runway to operate that yeah. way. Um, and Monsanto is another watershed moment. I mean, they kind of don't exist as a company anymore, for better or for worse. I mean, their products are still around, but, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter that they don't exist. Their products and mentality right. is still around. But beyond functional foods, I think the, the b big thing I'm also feeling is still eating whole foods and whole foods grown well, that's still the surest fire way. I mean, every, I think there's not many nutritionists who wouldn't agree with that, that there's no vitamins in the world that are so good that they're better than eating the food where you get those nutrients. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a few minutes left and I'd like to open it up to the questions. Yes, please. That's the end goal, yeah, because that's the biggest market. Okay. Has, do you have any strategies in place to do that, or do mm -hmm. you have any ideas mm -hmm. of, of what, you know, what would you propose? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of technology starts as a, uh, we call them MVPs, or minimum viable products. Just think of them as proof of concept, right? That can, you can be talking about an investment fund or a product. Um, essentially to ensure that you have the right product market fit. And once that fit is insured, then you can scale that, right? So both the fit and the actual production means. Because once you have the fit, then you can put money into the production means to get it cheaper. So the two biggest examples of this, or, or the biggest example is Tesla, right? It's in Harvard Business School, it's literally called the Tesla strategy, right? Starting high end, a really small demographic, and then moving on from there, and slowly getting into a broader market. Impossible Foods follow that strategy to a T specifically with its Southeast Asia expansion, right? They started in, I think their launch was in a Hardinier, which is one of the fanciest restaurants in San Francisco. And then they moved on into a couple other restaurants, and then Umami Burger, and some bigger chains in New York and bigger cities around the country, right? And then they moved to White Castle. And so that transition, specifically along the cost curve, could only be established once you had proof of concept established in the coasts, right? So does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, you touched on the uh, connection between GMO and the uh, lab-grown meat. The problems with GMO and the public acceptance of it is still there. Mm -hmm. People worry about foreign DNA or foreign genes and so on. Will that same problem recur with lab-grown meat, stem cells and stem cancer cells? And, and do we need to worry about the DNA from those cells and how do we eat it? 
I think it's a bit too early to tell. I'm not a scientist, so I, I can't dive into the specifics. But from an investment point of view, which is a lot of risk mitigation, um, this is definitely on our mind, and we're definitely looking at parallel trends throughout history, specifically around GMOs, right? Um, but I think a lot of um, GMO products that have done well have either fully embraced that trend, right? If you look at billboards around Soylent, their tagline is, we are GMO, deal with it, right? And same with, same with Impossible Burger, they're proudly GMO. They're proudly GMO, yeah. right? Especially once they got um, uh, grass status from the FDA. Uh, that's generally recognized as safe. Um, so yeah, we're looking, uh, again, from a risk mitigation lens, but at the same time, products will be successful if they're cheaper than alternatives and they can directly correlate their benefits with some sort of benefit internally and externally, specifically how people correlate those products with their self-image, what it says about you. If you're drinking soil and that says something about you, whether it's just that you're a tech bro in San Francisco, right? Um, which is obviously not everyone's label um, and not a desired label. But I think once lab-grown meat can reach uh, a, a cost parity that it can start integrating with other meat products, right? It's not going to get to market first with the full product. It's going to be mixed with traditional meat. And some of these products will be going B2B, right? So selling to other businesses that will mix them in or directly to consumer at some sort of mixed level. Um, but if it's cheaper and if you're looking to a consumer base, again, high end, like you said, the proof of concept that are willing to try some of these products and then you enter mainstream conversation. I mean, I, I know lab grown and, and plant based are two very different conversations, but Impossible Foods is a pretty good example of a path to market that we're starting to take a look at. Yeah, and especially with, you know, all of us moving into the food tribalists, you know, because with social media and the image that we're projecting with the foods that we eat, like you were saying, with soy nut or whatever, or plant based or whatever it is, we all identify with special label who we are. And I think Brian can talk about it because that's what you do with, uh, with your publication is creating these communities and, or tribes, if you will, of people that are trying to identify themselves with a particular food culture. Yeah, and our tribes, I would say, and this is a fairly strong type of food tribe, is, is about geography and the people around you, so the food right. and drink producers mm -hmm. and makers in your area. Um, but I think that all the eco-labels that we use for food, local, organic, regenerative, etc., that's also really shifting rapidly. And organic uh, is, there are people running away from organic right now because organic in the last year has allowed in two or three practices, which for the longest time people said, oh, they'll never propose that in the National Organic Standard. So greenhouse grown in no soil, in hydroponics, can now be certified organic. And that was, it, that blew people away and it took a few years to get that done. So a lot of producers are saying, I'm done with organic. Let me get some other certification. I don't stand for that anymore. But it'll al probably allow it to grow even larger. You know, Earthbound Organic and some of the big salad companies, they have indoor production that they need certified to, you know, mm -hmm. get into their markets. So um, I, I think, I think the lesson from the GMO concerns, overblown or not, or I mean, it's such, um, I mean, what's the term? It's like kryptonite. You know, no one really, you know, if you feel sensitive about that debate, it's not going to be easy to sway someone. But that's also getting fragmented. I mean, GMO doesn't even describe what's going on now. There's the term CRISPR, which is kind of like a second generation genetic engineering. Um, there's all, you know, genomic analysis. There's all sorts of other stuff going on that is not the ge genetic engineering we were talking about 20 years ago. Right, right. It's a different The Monsanto stuff. It's a whole stuff. different animal. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different animal. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for asking. Basically, I would say, in a nutshell, not enough. I think that, that more um, chefs need to simply get seaweed in their hands and start, you know, innovating. Um, you know, I did some of this reality cooking, and I hate to you know, say it, that do, doing Top Chef Masters, you're put in an uncomfortable situation with some ingredients you probably wouldn't have chosen if, if you were in charge. But you might come up with something really special and dynamic. And I think if, if we just simply put more seaweed products in the hands of more chefs and said, deal with it, because you don't have your chicken stock or you don't have your butter or you don't have your time, with things that we just rely on you know, day in and day out, 
I think that they would they would innovate at a level that would really really uh, really be interesting. I would say at the production level too. There's also really not enough. I mean, there's maybe two or three companies in the world that are really trying to blow out seaweed production, and there's a Bay Area company, Terravia, that went out of business. They were trying to do that, and they just ran out of money and you know closed up shop. So there's another one, Algama, which is starting to show up in supermarkets, and it's mostly sort of ingredients as opposed to flat seaweed. But I agree. It seems like, and, and in terms of efficiency, it's you know as low down on the food chain as you can get. Right. Well, it's not just uh, it's not just uh, seaweed. Actually, it's it's um, there's a lot more to it than that. So there's algae right now is being utilized um, on a massive scale. Whether it's going into uh, fish feed um, in aquaculture or whether it's actually being used to create oils. So there's an oil right now that's in like 10,000 Walmarts or something like that, that um, that's ba uh, it's, it's made out of um, uh, a reduction of, of, of algae into oil. Right, so well, we, should, we should clarify that algae is seaweed, it's just sure. micro and macro. So we're looking at like various sizes of seaweed, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we kind of forget that 60% of the oxygen we get is comes from algae in the ocean. You know, it's, we, we should be thankful for it, and it's something we should sort of learn more about and integrate more into, into what we eat. Well, and also the other thing that's interesting about algae, so um, if you look at models of what would happen if global warming went to like the nth degree or, or ocean acidification, you would end up with jellyfish and algae. So uh, there, you know, there's, just, there's probably an end of day scenario where we'd really want to learn this stuff quickly. Um, but I think also too, on the other side of it, um, we'll make a soup. yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's the eat what the ocean gives you. Yeah. Right. Well, it might already be a soup if, if, if climate change keeps going in that direction, yeah. a very warm one. Um, but I think, uh, um, you know, there's also something as just as simple as seaweed being turned into, so obviously in Asia it's, it's like snack food, right? And here it's not. There's people that are trying to do that and bring it here. And I think if you saw, you know, seaweed crisps and chips and snacks and all this other stuff a lot more often, people would be a little bit more familiar with it, the consumer demand. Um, the history of consumer demand would be there. Companies would be like, oh, why are, you know, there's a hole in that space, let's fill it. So. I think you know it's it's it probably a uh, you know on a few levels there's there's you know from the chef level to just general consumption mm -hmm. um, in a variety of different ways that you know we can in, things are starting to happen let's just say that and actually I mean I'm a neighbor of Kerry's in New York and uh, in where we are they've just given out the first permits to grow kelp to grow um, what do they call it frozen kelp or winter kelp it grows during the winter yeah, which is it, the it, wildest it, yeah. thing right it grows it, in frigid water and and it and it metabolizes nitrogen which we have too much of so it, it is the ultimate answer to balancing uh, an environment that we have physically through our presence thrown off balance and, it, and it's impactful I mean the, the the excess nitrogen will eventually kill all of the shellfish and finfish that we are sort of depending on so we need to find a way to mitigate it and here is the perfect answer and then I think, too, uh, if somebody can figure out a way to eat red tide, that might be a good thing for certain people down south. Um, but one other thing that's... animals. Yeah, I mean, well, and so speaking of that, one other thing that's really interesting is uh, there's some, some research and there's some companies involved right now in taking uh, seaweed and, and using that as a land animal feed. Um, specifically, one of the benefits is a reduction in uh, carbon emissions. Um, so... You know, there's kind of some interesting things going on with it, and I, I think oh, you mean you mean the animals uh, have left less methane? When, or, yeah. yeah, right. Uh, yep. Okay, we're going to take one last question, and question. yes. I was I was actually going to say the same thing. I, that's yeah. I'm fascinated by mushrooms. I've been foraging mushrooms since I was a kid. So yeah, um, the quickly if uh, because we got to wrap um, the future of mushrooms and uh, because people are beginning to understand actually the medicinal benefits and the nutritional profile of mushrooms and uh, you can also slot it into indoor agriculture it's very conducive to that <coughs> which is also trending home, not just exactly not, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah in terms of indoor agriculture a uh, small hold um, in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn is doing incredibly cool stuff uh, they just got into Whole Foods I believe they, they grow like 50 different mushroom varieties indoors in this big warehouse and they're just you know they want to open farms all over America yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's called small hold. 
Yeah, yeah, you should definitely check it out. Um, but in terms of uh, mushrooms being a part of the future of food, um, that's definitely something that falls within what we're calling alternative proteins. So instead of clean meat, alternative proteins. Right. Within the alternative proteins, primarily it's plant-based and fungi-based. And, and we distinguish those pretty pretty distinctly. Um, I mean, the partner at our fund, Ryan Bethencourt, started a company called Wild Earth, which is using koji, which is an ancient um, fungi um, that is already uh, essentially has already reached lab scale and they can already produce products using it, just mixing it with ingredients that we uh, know and love, whether it's flour, uh, pumpkin, peanut butter. Um, but they're looking at different markets, right? So instead of just disrupting um, human food, they're looking at pet food, right? Because over a third of the meat produced in the United States from large scale animal agriculture is used for pet food. And so there's a lot of different markets, again, coming back to that focus that we're looking to make an impact on. I think we've resolved the future of our food. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so Thanks. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.